Well, good morning and welcome to chapel, the campus of New Orleans Seminary. As you can tell, this is a little bit uh, different format uh, from our typical chapel service. We're uh, blessed today uh, to have as our guest in chapel, John Irwin. I will introduce him a little bit more in just a moment. What I want to do is just uh, uh, read a passage and then pray, and then we will dive into this time uh, of worship, hearing what God is doing uh, and some exciting things that God is doing. Psalm 85 says this, You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, O God, our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you, God, for the presence of both in this place this morning. And we pray simply, Lord, that you would move in our midst. Lord, as we talk about what you're doing and as we consider what you might do, I pray, God, that you would help us to focus on you. Lord, help us to be overwhelmed by who you are. God, help us to be overwhelmed by the task to which you've called us so that we might turn our hearts and our minds back to you and depend upon you and you alone to do what only you can do. God, we desperately need you to work in our land. We need you to work in our lives. We pray that you would do just that. And God, we pray that that would happen this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before uh, bringing John up, I do want to uh, encourage you all to attend Tuesday and Thursday mornings, student-led prayer time, uh, right outside the chapel at 7.30. I want to invite you and encourage you to attend that, and we appreciate those who are spearheading uh, that effort to call us to engage us more uh, in prayer. Uh, this past spring, I got to uh, go to a preview of a movie that will be coming out next month. Uh, and when I watched the movie, I thought the movie was incredible. Uh, but not only the movie uh, was incredible, but uh, John Irwin, the writer, director, producer, uh, along with his brother, um, talked about his heart for the movie and his heart for um, the next generation. Uh, and so when I was listening to John share his heart about God's vision uh, and about the, the vision that God has given John and his brother for movies, uh, I just said, we, we got to have this guy come and, and talk to us and share his heart. So John Irwin is here today. Uh, John, come on up, man. Join me up here, and we will just uh, begin a conversation. John Irwin, welcome John uh, to chapel. Appreciate you having me, man. John is a busy guy. Obviously, his movie is coming out October 16th. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So he's traveling all over the place, doing a lot. So we appreciate you coming. Man. Oh, glad to be here. Glad, although I'd set my expe expectations low, being on the stage <laughs> of the seminary is, uh, is uh, I don't know. My dad has uh, uh, three degrees. We say one for... Um, him and one for each of his delinquent sons that went and joined the movie <laughs> business, but uh, one of those is from Dallas uh, Seminary, and uh, uh, so maybe that'll maybe I can get grandfathered up onto the stage. But beyond that, <laughs> beyond that, thanks for having me. <laughs> well, we are we are glad. Well, you mentioned your dad, and uh, just kind of background. Go ahead and tell us your story, your spiritual journey, yeah. and within that, how you came to uh, to filmmaking. Yeah, yeah, and again, I'm not recommending this. I'm not saying it's right. I remember uh, in terms of my story, I'm just saying it's what happened. Uh, <laughs> but uh, my, I'm born and raised in uh, Birmingham, uh, uh, Alabama. Uh, I would say Roll Tide, but I might get thrown don't out. Say, no, no, don't, no, I, no, I didn't say don't, that. Don't say that. I didn't say that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Some might appreciate you saying that. <laughs> I would. Um, and, uh, 
at any rate, I, uh, I have great parents and was raised in a great uh, church. And uh, so I prayed to receive Christ when I was five years old uh, and uh, was a homeschooled, very conservative Southern Baptist Republican, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, dedicated my life to Christ when I was um, 16 at a youth camp called Word of Life Island in New York. Um, but before that, when I was 15, uh, I was interning for a cameraman that, um, that w was at my church, and he was a freelance camera operator, and he'd do games all over the, I mean, all over the SEC for, for ESPN. And I would carry around his tripod for free. And when I was 15, somebody got sick in a University of Alabama football game, a cameraman, about three hours before kickoff, and, uh, and <laughs> Mike called me and said, uh, uh, John, I've talked to the director, get over here lie about everything. Don't tell anybody how old you are, that you've never done this before, or anything like that. Again, I'm not saying this is right. I'm just saying I was too naive to know not to do it. And uh, so I, I went over. My dad drove me. Uh, he dropped me off uh, four blocks from the stadium because I didn't want anybody to know I couldn't drive. And I went and did. And, <laughs> and I, I went and ran this Maybe camera. We fast forward things now, I'm sorry. This just happened. God can use anybody. But uh, is the theme of this story. But I was used to little cameras, you know. And uh, these cameras were huge. They were like a telescope. You could zoom into a quarter of the moon. And uh, and so I'm this 15-year-old kid just up on this camera at the top of the stadium just zooming in and out of the moon saying this is the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. And, uh, and I had a blast. I really did. And, uh, and there was a list, kind of a manifest from that game. And, uh, you know, in God's provision, uh, Birmingham is right in the middle of the SEC. So there's games everywhere. Uh, and, uh, and so I... I uh, I got called by a crewing agent, and she said, are you a freelance camera operator in Birmingham, Alabama? I, I'd never heard those three words together. <laughs> Didn't know what they meant. So I'm this 15-year-old kid. I'm like, why, yes, that's what I do. <laughs> Say that again. So I went and did a game in Auburn. And uh, so that was the start of my career and pretty much working full-time for ESPN. Uh, and so all of a sudden, I was this Christian kid that got tossed into the kind of the circus, you know, I was like, went and joined the circus, and, but oddly enough, that's when my faith became really real to me, uh, because I was the only one who had it in my uh, uh, workplace, and, uh, and it was a good transition for me, and, and in my life, and then my dad used money he didn't have to buy us a camera, and, uh, and the first Apple computer editing system, and we began, our company began to do videos for our church and ministries, and that became a hobby that went completely out of control as we were freelancing. In fact, I remember I, I freelanced for ESPN for years, and I remember doing a game here in New Orleans, and, and if, if they flew you to the game, you got, uh, they paid for your flight. But if you drove, you got like 51 cents a mile. So I'm this teenager, like I'll, I'll drive anywhere in the United States if I get paid. And so I, I, I would drive because you'd get the mileage. And so I did a game down here in New Orleans and I drove down here from Birmingham, uh, did a game, worked, so worked, drove seven hours, worked for 12 hours, and then just drove straight back. And I remember uh, getting like really bleary eyed at the end, like really getting really close to uh, my exit and finally getting to my exit. and. Uh, and, and the only thing I could remember is at the red light behind another car, I need to put the car in park. So I put the car in park and the next thing I remember, I'm like out cold in my window and there's a <laughs> cop in my window. So I stayed there in that intersection long enough to, for a, somebody to call the police. But uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, but at any rate, uh, I, while freelancing, Andy and I formed, uh, were forming our company and then the Christian artist Michael W. Smith gave us a break doing a music video for him and Amy Grant was soon to follow. And, um, and then Andy and I kind of made a, a, a name for ourselves there doing music videos, won a lot of awards doing Christian music videos, won one video of the year, three years consecutively, and had, had a very well-developed career. And then it was ruined by a question when uh, I went and worked for um, uh, Alex and Stephen Kendrick on the movie Courageous, which their movie in War Room is out in, uh, is out in theaters, number one film in America uh, uh, last week. is incredible. you got to see it if you haven't seen it. Um, uh, there's a trailer for Woodlawn in front of it, too. Uh, but uh, uh, at any rate, uh, I went to work for them to direct second unit because uh, a second unit director does all the action scenes and stuff like that. And they were doing, of course, Courageous as a police cop story, and they had some action scenes they needed to do. I'm, I love blowing things up on film and doing chasing. It's like my favorite thing in the world. And uh, so I went down there to do that, and Alex asked me, he said, John, uh, what's your purpose and the purpose of your work? And I couldn't answer the question. I didn't know the answer. Uh, to that point, Andy and I said, we're like the Han Solo of the 
of, of the Christian world. Like if you have money, we have a ship, we'll fly you somewhere, you pay us and that's it. The rest is your problem, you know? And, and that's just kind of who we were. And, uh, and not only could I not answer the question, but I, it, was like, it, it was like a splinter in my mind. And that was really the, the final nudge where we went from career to uh, calling, you know? which led to the film October Baby and Mom's Night Out and now Woodlawn. And when we began to understand the power a film could have in someone's life to help share the gospel, to help instigate ministry, to change people's life, in the case of October Baby, to literally save lives, I told people, I can't go back to spending $9,000 in one day for hair extensions for one country artist to look nothing like she looks like in real life. I can't do that anymore. You know, this is, I've tasted a calling instead of a career. And, and that was kind of the, the transition that, that has led us to this moment. Yeah. Well, you mentioned October Baby uh, dealing with that non-controversial issue of abortion, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, as your first, your first movie. I don't know why um, we did that. What was your, yeah. what were y'all's goals with that movie and how have you seen it uh, change lives? Well, yeah, October Baby was inspired by the true life story of Gianna Justin, who's, who is an abortion survivor and a wonderful, and I didn't even know those two words existed uh, and could go together. And I heard Gianna's story and um, again, I just, I couldn't stop thinking about it. So everybody expected us to do some kind of sports movie first or something. And when we said, no, we're doing a kind of a coming of age drama about a, a survivor of an abortion, everybody was like, are you guys literally crazy? But it was a, a movie about forgiveness. And, and, and yes, I think the best line for that movie is they say every boxer has a plan until you get in the ring and get hit. You know, and that was kind of like that movie. We didn't quite know what we were doing. But, uh, and then all of a sudden we, we did, I remember doing NPR Morning Edition and they, uh, the way I heard the first question was like, John, how do you sleep at night making this anti-abortion <laughs> propaganda? I'm like, I didn't really know that's what I did, but uh, just trying to tell a story. But I remember it very clearly when the story started coming in, number one, what we had hoped would happen and prayed would happen was that young girls would see the movie and have the courage to keep their child. I remember even in my hometown of Birmingham, a young girl paid for an abortion, scheduled it for the next morning, went and saw the film, not knowing what it was, thinking it was like The Vow or something. And it gave her the courage to keep her child and, wow. and, uh, and cancel her abortion the next day. And those Amen. stories started coming in from all over the country. Uh, and not even that, for the, because the story centered around forgiveness and grace, I remember thousands of women and even men, I remember a guy that's bigger than I am and uh, came up to me weeping, said, I, I paid for an abortion 20 years ago and I've never told anyone and I feel forgiven for the first time in my life, you know? Wow. And, uh, or I remember a 12 year old little boy that came up to me and said, your movie um, changed my life. And I said, I really literally said to him, I think you watched a different movie. You were probably <laughs> in Pirates of the Caribbean. And, uh, but uh, he said, my dad, you know, has done some things that have hurt my mom and I've been angry. I'm going home to forgive my father. This little kid, and I'm just like, thank you, son. You know, and uh, you begin to understand the power that these things can have to, 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 um, to change people's lives. And then the, the, the real epiphany was when we started hearing stories from all over the world, uh, South Africa, Australia, Bali, Ch handwritten letters from China, Russia, South America. And we didn't expect that at all. And what we didn't realize was that, because we, we thought, sat back and thought, wait a minute, how much of our time did it take us to take this message that we were so passionate about to the world? Um, because, you know, that's what we do as Christians, and it typically takes a lot of time and a lot of money. Well, the answer is it didn't take any of our time. We just find, signed a foreign distributor, uh, uh, distribution agreement. They did all the translation, all the territories, did all the translation, all the distribution. And uh, we said, well, how much of our money did it take? Well, it didn't take any, they paid us. So here's a global autopilot. And we had just tasted a little bit of it. And uh, we began to study it over the course of two years that how big could you dream? Because what we didn't realize is entertainment is America's second largest export. Anybody, anybody wanna guess what the first one is? He, he will give you $100 if you guess. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll have to borrow it. It's one, agriculture it is America's first, but entertainment is America's second largest export. And uh, not many people know this, but there's 10 movie theaters opening every day in China. It's the largest expansion wow. in the history of the world and uh, all over the world. And so we tasted a fraction of it and we started studying this of how do we take this thing and use it to, yeah. uh, to share the gospel. 
Yeah. Yeah. Now keep going. You and I have talked about this uh, in, in how this connects with your passion to reach this generation, the generation that's leaving the church yeah. and what you feel like God's called you to do to insert media, particularly films, into the lives of those who are leaving the church. Yeah, to instigate and get them back, first of all, and instigate the work that, that you guys do. I think there's no... One of the things that um, God has been moving in my life and the reason I love being here. I remember we had a premiere for Mom's Night Out. And again, I'm grateful for Mom's Night Out uh, that I got to, it's a profitable movie and I got to be paid by a studio to make, to my knowledge, the world's most expensive Hallmark card for my wife and everyone <laughs> like her. I mean, that's cool. My wife loved it. You know, my and uh, loved it. so I'm grateful. But I remember being at the premiere of, uh, of Mom's Night Out and it was at Grauman's Chinese Theater or the Chinese Theater, whatever they call it now, you know, with the handprints, which is like the Mecca. You know, that's like the temple for a filmmaker. And, uh, and you know, it was built in 1929 for DeMille, uh, DeMille's King of Kings. I mean, the, the, the tablets to the Ten Commandments are inside, and, you know, so is Dorothy's dress, all these things, you know. And, uh, and so that is everything you would expect that you want as a, a, a career. And both Beth and I just felt like, we just don't, this isn't us. First of all, L.A. is the worldwide capital of narcissism. I mean, you could like literally buy up every billboard in L.A. and just put the words, get over yourself, and it would be a worthy <laughs> endeavor. But, uh, but I, I just think that, that uh, it, it just wasn't, that's not, it just wasn't us. And we went down to Albany, Georgia the next week to be with, um, you know, Pastor Cat and wonderful family down there and just felt this is where we belong. And I felt God say clearly to me, you know, it's time that I stop trying to impress the wrong set of people. You know, uh, Universal or Sony or Hollywood or whatever is not the hope of the world. The local church is the hope of the world, and the pastor is its leader. And and I need to be doing what I do to support that. You know, and uh, and that has been a, a fundamental transition uh, between Mom's Night Out and Woodlawn. Is how do we instigate ministry and on a on a global scale? and uh, do it in a big way. And so in our study and in our research, we began to find out some really cool things. And um, not to bring up, because uh, we talked about this uh, backstage, so to, to risk, um, this would probably be risky to talk about theology <laughs> on this stage in this setting. I'm going to get eaten for breakfast, but, uh, but, but I'll try. You know, a fascinating thing in terms of the way the world is changing the world is changing at an incredibly rapid rate. It's the equivalent of a renaissance every five years. Um, there are, as of last year, more mobile devices than people on the earth. There's uh, 7.3 billion mobile devices. The people using those devices um, have more access to uh, mobile data than drinking water. It's staggering how connected the world has gotten. And on top of that, more people are flooding into cities. So for the first time ever, more people live in cities. I cannot say this word. More people live, live in cities than rural areas. Rural. Why is it the hardest word to say? Uh, Sound, I'm from Mississippi. Sounds right to me. Yeah, well, in Alabama, <laughs> yeah, in Alabama, we say it's, it's, it's rural, you know, yeah. which is... Uh, which yeah, is just uh, move through it real quick. Yeah, Andy and I were known as Bubba 1 and Bubba 2 <laughs> on ESPN crew, so I had to kind of do an do a accent cleanse because... New Orleans has a very good accent. It's got character. It's cool. Texas has a great, like the Matthew McConaughey thing. That's in not Alabama, how all Texas in talk, Alabama, no. we just—I mean, even in New Orleans, when you can't understand what you guys are saying, it still sounds cool, like the whole French thing or whatever. <laughs> in Alabama, we just sound dumb. Like our accent is just like um, it just—it's not. It's not, it does, we do not come off educated. Anyway, so I had to, I had to ditch it. And rural is still one, still one of the words I have a problem with. But uh, uh, at any rate, more people live in cities than rural, rural areas for the first time ever, right? And with that is coming a, a explosion in entertainment infrastructure, okay? So 30% um, uh, increase globally in box office in the last five years. In China, like I say, it is staggering. 10 movie theaters a day uh, are, are opening. 10 separate locations. And um, so we did a two-year research project to say, what do they watch? And uh, what is the world watching? What, what entertainment do they consume? And it's really encouraging. If you, um, 
if you think of it as a bullseye, there's 20,000 movies made all over the world every year in, in every developed territory. About 3,000 in America, about 700 of those get released in theaters. Of those, about 150 make north of $5 million like October Baby did, Cinderella Story, wonderful, thank you for everyone that supported it. But, but we can't stop there because if you keep going in to the center of that bullseye, it's about 31 movies uh, in 2012, a little over uh, last year. Um, uh, that cross this benchmark called it's a hundred million dollars in box office and and there's a word for those movies you might know what what it is blockbusters I heard it yeah I wait so somebody knows uh, but uh, uh, they're blockbusters those 30 American movies are doing 60 percent of all business in the United States wow. those same 30 movies are doing 40 percent of all business in the world so this in my opinion is the most advanced, widest form of communication ever invented in the history of the world. And because of the change in technology, we have the biggest opportunity for the gospel ever. Uh, and that excites me. Hmm. And I think we should be, with all the chaos in the world, man, we should be excited to be alive today. Uh, because what we were talking about is... Uh, you know, it's in Luke 24. Uh, my pastor, who was just in his office, who was my pastor? Uh, David Platt. I, I, I'm a member of the Church of Brook Hills. Um, Brother Tom Elif stole him. But uh, <laughs> at, at any rate, um, uh, you know, he was preaching on this, and I never even thought of it this way. Growing up, a good preacher, Southern Baptist, reader of all the Left Behind books, you know, uh, in term, when I think of end times, uh, I think of, you know, what are the signs of the end times, and you think of a lot of what's in Matthew 24, which is the rumors of wars and chaos and, you know, the, the searing off of a conscience, you know, that the, the, the love of many will grow cold, which is happening in main part because of my business. There's a lot of science behind that. Uh, and all these things. And, and like, and then, but the one who endures till the end, you know, will be saved, says and That's kind of where I always stop reading. But the next verse is, and this gospel... Uh, will be proclaimed to the whole world in every nation as a testimony. And then the end will come. So it's like the final step is the proclamation of the gospel to the entire world. And we are the first generation that genuinely has that opportunity. That is our moonshot. That is, that, that is a real possibility because of technology. And as much... Uh, as many bad things as this technology brings, certainly it brings all kind of chaos for parents. You know, you think about how to control uh, the influences on your child. It's almost impossible now. But with those problems, it's bringing enormous opportunity. And uh, so I think that as a Christian, the mindset that we should have is that we hold the message as sacred, the message of the gospel, but not the mechanism of delivery. The mechanism, you know, one changes. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. The other does not. Uh, uh, the uh, One does not change. The gospel doesn't change. See, I'm in a seminary. This is going to go bad. Uh, the gospel doesn't change, but the, the, the mechanism changes. And so I think when there's a new mechanism, we owe it in this Hebrews 11 distance medley relay that we're all on to go take that mechanism of delivery for the sake of the gospel and to get aggressive and to play offense, you know, Amen. which, by the way, I think we're built for offense. We're not built for defense. I mean, the Bible says that on this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. A gate is not an, off a defensive, or an offensive weapon. Nobody's going to throw a gate at you. Nobody's going to attack you with a gate. It's a defensive mechanism. We're built for offense. We're built for cultural offense. I'm tired of us all playing defense. And, uh, and I think we need to get aggressive and say, look, this is a way to share the gospel with the whole world. Let's figure it out. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the journey that we're on. Could it be possible that a Christian film with an overt Christian worldview made by a Christian could be a blockbuster? Uh, and we believe the answer to that question is absolutely yes. I don't know how long it's going to take to get there, but the question is absolutely yes. And we feel like if there's a way to take that platform, this would be what would happen, which would be really cool. If enough Christians could unify in common purpose and in common objective, uh, then there's this problem that we all face in church, a lot of uh, debate about the statistics. 
but uh, a generation is indeed leaving. You know, as you know, the high statistic is 70 percent. Um, you know, there was a great CNN story with the Pew Research about the decline in Christianity due to millennials leaving from 78 percent to 70 percent in America over the last seven years. So a generation is is leaving the church, spiritually engaged, 18 year old going off to college. Uh, they're leaving. Typically, they would grow up and they would come back. Um, you know, they would get married, have kids, and don't we all know that's when you start really coming back to church in earnest, like help me figure out my life. Uh, but, uh, but they're not, they're not growing up. They're not getting married and they're, you know, like if you look at Call of Duty commercials on television, you know, they're like 30 year old men. So yeah. they're, they're, there's a generation that hasn't grown up. And uh, so, so there's another group called frequent moviegoers that buy the majority of movie tickets. Um, they, are, they buy 60% of movie tickets, but they're only 14% of the population. So that's, wow, that's 40 million movies. people buying 800 million movie tickets, about 20 each. You have to, to qualify, you have to see more than one movie a month. Are there any frequent movie goers here? I am. Ah, oh, there's one in the back. Yes. She's like, I kind of, I'm sorry. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but at any rate, um, if you study them, uh, guess who they are? There's some anomalies. People over the age of 55 are going to the movies more than ever which is great. Uh, but guess who they are? They're the generation leaving the church. It's almost a dead-on statistical match. And this is what's exciting. You know what motivates their behavior? This thing called FOMO. Anybody know what that is? Fear of missing out. Dominates their behavior. You wanna know how to get a frequent moviegoer to go see a movie? Just talk to them about a movie they haven't seen. It'll drive them crazy. They'll go see it the next morning, right? They're terrified of missing out. Because here's what's happened. The average teen has about 250 friends on Facebook and other uh, you know, social platforms. But the, the number of people that you could count on in the event of a life crisis has been steadily declining since the 1950s. So we're getting more connected, but we're getting much more lonely. Uh, you know, the iPhone is a very isolating device. And so you have a generation whose main characteristic is loneliness and yet they have this digital window in the lives of so many people. And so with that, there is coming this, they, this insatiable need to belong to something and this terrifying fear of missing out. And my business preys on that. It's to see the way a movie like Fifty Shades of Grey that nobody likes, the critic score low, the audience score terrible, preys on that phenomena of the fear of missing out and manipulates a generation without, talk about sheep with no shepherd. Uh, it's, it's wrong and it's scary and, uh, and we have to play ball, you know. And so if enough of us, I remember uh, when, I, uh, <laughs> I, when I graduated high school, uh, we already had kind of a company and a, a couple of employees, but I wanted to get away for a year just to get away and work on myself. So I went to this Bible Institute, Word of Life Bible Institute in Screen Lake, New York, wonderful place. And, uh, and it was a wonderful year of my life. And I remember... Uh, I signed up for open air evangelism. <laughs> and so I don't know if you guys do that or if, uh, if anybody here does open air, but, uh, but we're for it. So I, what's that? We're for it. We're All right. Good stuff. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, so then they, they, they literally do a, a 10 minute demonstration of a board you have to paint and then they ship us down to New York city. So all of a sudden Alabama boy in Manhattan painting a board, you know, it was just terrifying, you know, and uh, but here's how they did it. There were 20 of us, one of us would paint on the board, the other 19 would watch. Well, in New York, in Manhattan, if 20 people are doing anything, guess what happens? Everybody, what's going on? What's going on? I'm missing out. What is this? You know, and so the, the, the bad thing was you're painting this board and there's 20 of your friends just laughing at you from the front row because you're making all these, like you're supposed to write turn and trust like one time I wrote Trun and Turst, and you have to just keep going. Uh, and, uh, but that, that, that's the fear of missing out, and that is dominating the decisions of a generation. So there is a way that if we could make enough noise, like Jericho style, if we could all yell at once, that a wall between us and a generation would collapse. And we could get a generation back by the fear of missing out. Now it would take enough of us unifying in common purpose and common vision with a common plan. Uh, but I can prove to you that it will work because it worked for another group. Again, I just, I love to study what works. Uh, the gay community got together in February 28, 1988 in Virginia. They called it the War Conference. And they unified, they jettisoned a strategy that was no longer working, which looks a lot like what we're doing now as evangelicals and Republicans and such. And they championed a strategy that was very well thought out, very, very smart. 
and it was centered around the arts, making people feel something. Because if you can change the way they feel, you can then they will change the way they think, and it worked. It worked, and it worked. Obviously, six million people changed the opinions of 90 million people over the course of two decades. My point is, if they can do it, so can we. And maybe it's time that we get a little shrewd and a little aggressive, and we can unify in a common strategy and a common vision. The second, so I think we can get a generation back with this phenomena of the fear of missing out. If we make the movies big enough, and if we unify enough of our people underneath them, right? And then the last thing I'll say about that is there's this amazing thing called output deals. Nobody really knows about that, but my business runs on this phenomena called output deals. And what that is, is Netflix, for instance, paid us a several hundred thousand dollars to put October Baby in their library. Now, I did not have to go in the front door of Netflix, meet with their executives, and have an ideological anti-abortion, what they would call it, debate. I distributed through, through Samuel Goldwyn Films, who has an output deal with Netflix. So it just becomes math. So not only did Netflix have to take it, they had to pay the same price for it, they had to give it the same platform and the same audience, right? Wow. So here's a way to force the gospel to yeah. the world, right? And so um, foreign output works the same way. There's a way if we could dream big enough together that we could force the gospel to the world in a way the world could not refuse, every developed country in the world. And there would be a way to put the gospel, to share the gospel wider than it's ever gone, faster than it's ever been spread on autopilot in a way the world can't refuse. There's countries where they could be locking Christians up in the streets, but they could not stop the movies because those movies would be tied to Jurassic World and Star Wars and the American blockbuster package. This is possible. Hmm. And, uh, and to me, it's one of the more fundamental opportunities for the gospel ever, if we could figure it out. And yes, it would require a pretty gigantic leap forward, but we are capable of that leap. There's enough of us. Um, uh, we have enough resources. We just have not had a unified strategy and have not had the will. And I think the biggest thing that needs to change in my life, in your life, in this seminary, in my company, in the body of Christ aggregate, is I remember an investor's wife that said, you're losing me a little bit on the blockbuster stuff. Isn't it hard to make a blockbuster? I said, of course it is. I told her, there's a famous filmmaker that said, if it's like a sermon or a book. If we knew how to make hit movies, that's all we'd make. Like if there was some sort of like manual, it's his art, okay? But I said this, if we don't aim for it, we'll never hit it. And as long as we think that we're not capable of it, then we won't be capable of it. We've got to change the way we view ourselves. And I think those are some of the biggest lies, and maybe that's why so much of Paul's writing is dedicated to him just telling us who we are. Because our actions come out of that. And I think as long as we see ourselves as culturally defeated, as irrelevant, that the culture war is over, please hear me, the culture war is not over. A generation Amen. is not lost. Yes, we're losing for the first time in the history of our country. But the game's not over. And there's a lot of us. And um, I'm sorry, there's enough evangelical wealth in Dallas, Texas alone to change the world like 50 times. We have plenty of stuff. We have plenty of money. We have plenty of people. We just have not had a heart for a generation. And we have not had the will. And I think that that's what needs to change. And we have to start believing in who God says we are, not who the media says we are or who culture says we are. We can do this. We can do it together. And I think there's amazing things that we could do in fields like movies or just in our communities, if we would just change the way we thought about ourselves. Because that those are the crippling lies of the enemy, are the lies of, that relate to identity. So that's the basic thesis and that's the basic dream. If enough of us could unify, if we could dream big enough, if we could put the gospel on a much bigger stage. People ask me, we spent, um, we didn't spend two or three million dollars on, on Woodlawn. We spent 25 million on Woodlawn uh, between the production and marketing. And yes, believe me, I tell people I, I'm like cement shoes at the bottom of the river accountable to Woodlawn. Uh, <laughs> it's scary. And I go to bed at night thinking about how scary it is, believe me. Um, ask my wife. But the way I look at it, there's one way to look at it, to be horrified by how much money that is. The other way to look at it is it's a third of what Fifty Shades of Grey spent to get to a generation. Mm got to ask, how much do we care? But if we could dream a little bigger, and if we could unify, stop fighting each other like we are, we could get a generation back and we could change the world. And I'm telling you, we could be the first generation to Trojan horse the gospel, to take the gospel through technology to the entire 
world. Nobody's had that opportunity before. In my business, one of the things that happened with, uh, uh, and then I'm, I'm going to stop. This is like the 18-minute answer. I'm sorry. Uh, you got me going. My wife says, like, I'll pitch small children and inanimate objects, and like, I, this is my passion. Uh, one of the things in my uh, business, when we distributed October Baby, we distributed it on film. We sent film prints all around the country. This was in 2012. By the time Mom's Night Out came around in 2014, uh, the digital revolution, we call it, was complete. Uh, not in America, mostly complete around the world. So uh, Paramount was first, Sony was quick to follow. So I'm glad we kept those film prints because they're pieces of history now. Uh, for the first time ever, there is a single, unified, digital, global standard uh, called a digital cinema print. It's called a DCP. It's a file on a hard drive. It'll play on 130,000 locations all around the world, 10 opening every day in China. The opportunity that is before us is brand new. And my Bible reads, it's, it's, it's required of a steward that he be found faithful. Uh, we have been stewarded with, as a generation, with the first generation that can reach the entire world with the gospel. We will be held accountable to how we steward this opportunity. And I hope we steward it well together. And I hope that we see a revival in a generation, which is a lot of what Woodlawn is about. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Um, yeah, I was thinking of William Carey's quote, uh, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. Sounds like that's what you're doing. We appreciate it. You mentioned Woodlawn. Uh, we actually have a clip here we want to show and then get your uh, uh, feedback on. Sorry, I just kind of went off. About. That's all right, man. That's, just, that's why you're here. Yeah. You're here to go off. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we invited you to do. So we'll watch a uh, clip of Woodlawn. Jesus says to love our enemies. We have to love those that oppose us. If you only love those that love you back, what kind of love is that? There's something special about you. I can see it. You have a gift, and you have to decide what you want to do with it. I mean, I play for a team that doesn't even want me. Anybody like me? I'd like to have a meeting with the football team. I've seen things all over the country. Well, you and I can see that meeting. Do something about this. It's not my fault, Owen. Trying to coach football. He's bigger than football. What would you say if I told you it doesn't have to be this way? What would you be prepared to do? I'm asking you right now to stand up and make a decision to change. Forgive, to be forgiven. That's how much God loves you. What just happened? Look at me. I'm proud of you. Win or lose, you must. The good book says, without a vision, the people perish. I say, go give it to them. How many black players you got? Not nearly enough. Why you see that changing? Because it's time. You know the difference between you and these people? They're cowards. And you ain't. Nobody out there knows what's happened with this team. But when you win on this day, they will! They call him Touchdown Tony Nathan. He's home from right in Birmingham. This is your moment. This is your time. So you go and take it. You go and take it. This is what happens when God shows up. That's Woodlawn. Yeah. I should talk more about the film. It's funny. I went, I went to see Focus on the Family, and, and, and I keep doing this where I, I just talk about cultural opportunities and the vision, and I don't talk about the film at all. And uh, so I should say, yes, this Woodlawn, please go, please go see it. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and, and the thing I love about it is it was Michael Catt at Sherwood that said, John, um, I don't know if you have that prayer thing, again, which has nothing to do with film, but, uh, but uh, uh, he said, John, you need to go make this movie. I feel that America is going to be ready for this movie. He told me this last summer. Now, we didn't know 
because Woodlawn is the story of 1973 Birmingham, Alabama, my hometown, a school that was going to close because of violence, because of integration, because of racism. And uh, nothing could fix it. And it was a revival that started on the football team. The entire football team gave their lives to Christ in one moment and decided to love each other. And it literally saved the school and shook the city of Birmingham. Uh, it led to the largest high school game that's ever been played there. And as I studied it, asking honestly, could this really happen? Because the stories were just that extraordinary. I discovered uh, something that history uh, came to know as the Jesus movement. And I just confronted head on my own, my generation's happy meal Christianity, mm. our own narcissism and complacency and apathy. And really a hunger has been birthed in my life. And I think in the lives of many, including people like Ronnie Floyd, you know, and, and uh, head of the convention to see the Jesus movement, to see another movement of God in our time and in our generation. And that is the why of Woodlawn. We want to see that happen again. And I think it can happen again. I remember I was talking to Mike Huckabee, whose life was changed in the Jesus movement, dedicated his life to Christ at Explo 72 in Dallas. Nobody was at Explo, were they? I'm not sure. Yeah, yes! I, uh, I, I was with Paul Eshton. I, I want another Explo to have my parents were at Explo. And, and, uh, and just that was kind of the culmination of, I'm a fanboy, sorry. But uh, at any rate, uh, I want to see it happen again. And I asked Governor Huckabee who was there. His life was changed there uh, during the, a candle lighting ceremony that's featured in the movie. And, uh, and I said, how much did desperation have to do with what happened in your generation? He said it was everything. Free love, drugs, rock and roll didn't work. Vietnam, the world was scary. Uh, desperation was everything. And I said, look, I feel that for the first time in my lifetime, I feel that desperation returning. I think this is my generation's 1968. And so many of the same things are happening. And the cover of Time Magazine three issues ago was Ferguson, or Baltimore, and it had 1968 scratched out with 2015. So it's like, please, this is a fundamental opportunity, moment in time for the gospel. And we must go take it. And we must go take it together. And I believe that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would definitely uh, encourage, recommend uh, going to see Woodlawn. The, the, Woodlawn deals with so many issues that need to be addressed. Racial reconciliation, unity, um, fatherhood, mm -hmm. manhood. There's yeah. a, uh, an incredible sort of juxtaposition between two mm -hmm. fathers. And you see... Uh, bad father, bad fathering and good fathering, which is uh, we desperately need to address. But then, uh, it's like I told you when I watched it, the story can't be told without seeing the work of Jesus. Yeah. You see where they're going, you see this incredible change, and then you see where what happens there, and there's only one answer. It's because God moved. Yeah, he put it on the poster. It's one way. Yeah. John 14, 6. I mean, that, that, that was the, as we studied and we wrestled with this, that was the theme of the Jesus movement. If you look at the Time magazine, Jesus Revolution, 1971, you read the article, which will make you weep. See how far we've slid from this very beautiful, pure thing. Um, you know, there's this whole thing that the symbol of the movement was one way, you know, was these bumper stickers and stuff. And that's one of the reasons why we had to put together the 25 million outside the system of Hollywood. Because, number one, we want the funds to be able to compound into bigger movies. We're, we have been on the equivalent of a 15-year hamster wheel at the studio level. And uh, our, our profits in Christian films do not, are not earmarked, do not increase into more Christian films. So we want to do it there. But the other reason was that was one way. I mean, studios would never let me. I mean, Sean Astin in the movie says, you know, there, there's one way. We're gathered here. Um, uh, not in the names of our teams or our schools, but the name above every name, Jesus. And uh, who is the way? And and uh, uh, movie studios would never let me do that. Yeah. A way, maybe John. You know, one of many ways, one of many roads to the same house or whatever. But the way, absolutely not. And uh, and now because of the generosity of Christians all over America, businessmen, uh, no movie studio would let me do it before. No movie, no movie studio can stop me now. You know, and uh, from doing it in thousands of theaters across America. And uh, but that that is. There is one answer to what we're dealing with today in our own lives, in America, in our schools. Um, and his name is Jesus. It's that simple.
and that is what drives the story. And it is a very entertaining movie, and I think it's a bit of a Trojan horse, and those that go see it as a sports movie with John Voight as Bear Bryant uh, are going to love it. But uh, in them loving it, it's a vehicle for the gospel, and it, it pulls no punches. Yeah. And, oh, by the way, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I've talked too much, but we showed it for the first <laughs> time to uh, 250 high school students, football players, football teams, and um, with FCA just to test it, because we tested it a lot with leaders, and 50 of them in the room came to Christ almost spontaneously. Wow. It was unbelievable. And then at another church, uh, one of the things that I love about the story is that the coach is a cynic for half of the story. He doesn't want to believe what's going on. And his prayer that his actual salvation prayer for the real character from history that changed his life was, God, I don't know if you're real, but I want whatever my players have. Mm -hmm. And that's what changed his life. And, uh, and a guy came up, we showed it at a church in Columbus because they're doing an incredible, extraordinary, buying like 5,000 tickets and rallying their whole community. And so, of course, we took it up there. And, uh, and a member of, of his church came, walked up to the pastor and said, um, uh, you know, I've been to your church like two or three times. I'm not a church person. I don't know the lingo. I don't know what to say, but all I know is I'm that coach in that film and I want whatever's in that movie. Wow. And they shared, they talked for a half hour and the guy prayed to receive Christ, he and his wife. So the idea that I can instigate culturally your ministry that is my goal for the rest of my career. And I tell people I'm not, I'm not marketing a film, we're marketing a promise that if you'll help us, especially on the back of Woodlawn, we wanna serve the church for the rest of our lives. And we're not trying to, to get through the church to Hollywood, we're trying to bend Hollywood to the church. And this is the kind of film we wanna make for the rest of our lives, thinking not only, we thought so much of how to get people out of the church into the movies, we're trying to reverse that question. How do we get people out of the theaters and back into church? How do we push a generation back? And how do we instigate ministry? Because we're called to discipleship, and I don't work in the business of discipleship. I mean, think about it. A film is a one-way communication, okay? Uh, so I, what I do is horribly incomplete, no matter how much money I make, without what you do. And so if I could help instigate what you do on a grand level, that would be a pretty cool relationship. I tell people, Oh gosh, 15 years and oh, 30 pounds ago at least. I used to love to play uh, beach volleyball, but I was still never great at spiking a volleyball. But boy, could I set one for someone else to spike. Uh, that's what I do, and that's what I hope to continue to do. And uh, October 16th is a pretty big moment. We've leveraged everything on the back of a dream and on the back of what we believe God's going to do in a generation, and that's an honor. But uh, it doesn't work without you. You're the one that makes it a movie. We've done everything we can. The rest is up to you. If we can all make enough noise together in one moment, uh, we can get a generation back. We can change the world. By the way, that number is 3 million Christians. 3 million Christians doing the same thing together as one at the same time can literally shake the entire world. And that's the number I'm looking for. And that number's possible. It's very, very possible. So thank you for letting me uh, talk. I hope I haven't ru ruined your day by talking no, too long. No, no, well, uh, what we wanna do is we wanna close out in prayer. Uh, we wanna pray for uh, the movie, for the impact of the movie, for you, for your brother. Um, but even more than that, we want to pray uh, for what you, your heart, mm -hmm. as far as seeing another movement of God. What I'd like to do uh, to close us out, I'm going to ask Dr. Preston Nix to come up here. Uh, and uh, he witnessed Jesus' movement was changed forever by the Jesus movement. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to pray for us, Dr. Nix. Pray that God would do in this generation what he did in your generation. Mm -hmm. um, that, and that God would, would use this movie, would use other movies, War Room, uh, uh, all the other things that are, that are out there, uh, but truly that we would see revival in this generation. I know that's your heart, so lead us in prayer with that. Uh, yeah, I don't, it, let me give you this. Father, thank you so much for what we've experienced here in this place today. Thank you, Lord, for what we've heard. Thank you, Lord, for how you've moved in my heart today to remind me of who you are and what you can do, what you have done, what you want to do. And thank you, Lord, for what you put in the heart of John Irwin here to, Lord, be able to utilize what um, you have uh, allowed people to discover and 
and do and technology and movies and everything else, Lord, that uh, there is that possibility that everyone in the globe can hear the gospel. Thank you for that possibility, Lord. But we thank you most of all for Jesus who's changed our lives. And Lord, we thank you for what some of us got to experience in the Jesus movement where Jesus was known and popular in culture and songs and many things were about Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that you would move again. Lord, as I have passed it and prayed since those days, that we might see a breath, the breath of your spirit, the movement of your spirit once again in our land. Lord, we've gone so far away from you. We have forsaken you, Lord, and so many have gone away from the church, but thank you that we can partner together as a pastor and a movie maker, and Lord, to be able to reach again this generation with the gospel. I just pray, God, that Jesus would be known and that we will shout forth his name and people will know once again there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby me must be saved, the name of Jesus. And Lord, as we would cry out and say, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Oh, Lord, may we see a movement of your spirit. Jesus will be known very soon. And we ask it and pray it and ask it for your glory. Amen.